All right, hello everyone. Um, welcome to my channel. Uh, this is an educational channel, and we try to document some great theories of everything from the ancient and modern past um, to help um, with your paradigm shifting, your awakening to 5D consciousness, and your whole formation of a holistic worldview. Uh, today is our 518th video on uh, the reciprocal system of theory from Dewey B. Larson. And I'm kind of irate right now because I just recorded this and I have to do it again. So, uh, don't know why, but for whatever reason, um, we are looking at um, one of Larson's books called um, Basic Properties of Matter. This is a book that's primarily on chemistry, and it is a kind of a comparison between Larson's theoretical universe and his um, and the modern sciences um, empirical universe, what they've documented and compiled in their scientific tables. Larson, in 1959, arrived at his two fundamental postulates about how he believed the universe operated. And from there, through a process of deduction, he derived a theoretical universe, what his universe would look like if his postulates were correct. And then he compares his theoretical universe with the so-called actual universe of the modern scientists. And um, Basic Properties of Matter is one of the books where he does that. And we are about to start chapter 26 of this book called Atom Building. Now, Larson's reciprocal system is also known as the universe of motion. And um, it is because he is one of the uh, few scientists to attempt to construct his um, universe upon the foundation of not matter, not energy, not force, but motion. And uh, Larson was able to do this uh, where other philosophers who have attempted to do this basically failed. Larson was able to turn this into a generalized theory of everything uh, because of the way he defined motion. In particular, he defines motion as the relationship between space and time. And um, you can see this in you know, the most basic kind of motion that you can think of, speed. The runner is running at 10 miles per hour. 10 miles of space in one hour of time. Space divided by time is motion. Um, and you can see the reciprocal relationship there if you say, well, now the runner is sprinting. So double the speed. Uh, now the runner, you can say the runner is now running at 20 miles per hour, 20 miles of space in one hour of time. Or, alternatively and equivalently, you can say the runner is going at 10 miles per half hour. So you can either double the space or you can have the time. That evinces a reciprocal relationship between space and time. But Larson generalizes this not just to include speed, but to include all scientific phenomena. They are all forms of motion. Matter is a form of motion. Energy is a form of motion. Acceleration is a form of motion. Force is a form of motion. Pressure is a force of motion. Electric charge is a form of motion. Magnetic flux is a form of motion. Permeability is a form of motion. Capacitance is a form of motion. They all, and they all have their time over space or space over time signatures, uh, that being with, uh, you know, with exponents in included. So, for example, matter in Larson's system is time to the third power over space to the third power. Pressure is time over space to the fourth power. Acceleration is space over time to the second power. Force is time over space to the second power, and so on and so forth. And uh, then 
Larson also uh, more generally defines motion as what he calls scalar motion. And this is a motion that has a magnitude but no specific direction. So a scalar motion is when you have, um, take a balloon and uh, put dots on it with a magic marker. If you blow up the balloon, all of the dots will be moving away from each other. And so that is a scalar motion in that all of the dots are moving away from all of the other dots. Every dot is basically moving in every direction. There is no specific direction that you can point to until, unless you assign a reference point. If you arbitrarily say that one of these dots is motionless, then you can begin to assess the directions. But until you do that, you just have a generalized outward or inward motion. The outward motion of the balloon, Larson calls that the progression. And the inward motion, if you contract the balloon and all the dots are moving toward each other, he refers to that as gravitation. And those are the two basic motions um, that, um, you know, uh, exist in the universe. The progression is really a, uh, the source of all the motion, but gravitation is where um, things begin to manifest. And um, so um, Larson's first postulate states that uh, the universe is composed entirely of one component, motion, existing in three dimensions, in discrete units, and with two reciprocal aspects, space and time. And then he, from there, he plugs it into the second postulate, which is that the universe conforms to the relations of ordinary commutative mathematics. Its primary ap magnitudes are absolute, and its geometry is Euclidean. And from there, he derives his theoretical universe through the process of deduction. And... Um, if you'd like to get into a little bit more of that process, you want to check out any of my first 474 articles, uh, videos on um, this topic. And, uh, but for today, I'm going to basically assume that you have a working knowledge of the reciprocal system. Um, and I'm going to be reading from chapter 26 of this book called Atom Building. Several chapters of Volume 1 were devoted to tracing the path followed by the matter that is ejected into the material sector of the universe from the inverse or cosmic sector in the form of cosmic rays. As brought out there, the cosmic atoms that constitute the cosmic rays, three-dimensional rotational combinations with net speeds greater than unity, are broken down into massless particles, that is, particles with effective rotation in less than three dimensions. These particles are then reassembled into material atoms, three-dimensional rotational combinations with net speeds less than unity. The processes by which this rebuilding is accomplished have not yet been observed, nor has the applicable theory been fully clarified. It was stated in the earlier volume that our conclusions in this area were necessarily somewhat speculative. Additional theoretical development in the meantime has placed these conclusions on a much firmer basis, and it would now be in order to call them tentative rather than speculative. As brought out in chapter 20, 25, the currently prevailing opinion is that atom building is carried on by means of an addition process, addition processes of the type discussed in that chapter. For the reasons that were specified, we find it necessary to reject that conclusion and to characterize these processes to the extent that they actually occur as minor and incidental activities that have no significant influence on the general evolutionary pattern in the material sector of the universe. However, 
As noted in the earlier discussion, there is one addition process that actually does occur on a large enough scale to justify giving it some consideration before we turn our attention to broadening the scope of the explanation of the atom building process introduced in volume one. This addition process that we will now want to examine is what is known as neutron capture. The observed particle known as the neutron is the one we have identified as the compound neutron. It has the same type of structure as the mass one hydrogen isotope. That is, it is a double rotating system with a proton type rotation in one component and a neutrino type rotation in the other. In the hydrogen isotope, the neutrino rotation has the material composition M one half dash one half dash negative one. In the compound neutron, it has the cosmic composition C negative one half negative one half one dash one. The net displacements of this particle are M one half dash one half dash zero, the same as those of the massless neutron. The compound neutron is fully compatible with the ba basic magnetic two-dimensional rotational displacement of the atoms. And since it carries no electric charge, it can penetrate to the vicinity of an atom much more um, easily than the particles that normally interact in the charge condition. Consequently, the compound neutrons are readily absorbed by atoms. On first consideration, therefore, neutron capture would appear to be a likely candidate for designation as the primary atom building process. Nevertheless, the physicists relegate it to a minor role. The prevailing downgrading of the potential of neutron capture is mainly due to the physicists' commitment to other processes that they believe to be responsible for the energy production in the stars. If, as now believed, the continuing additions to the atomic masses are made as a collateral feature of the stellar energy production processes, neutron capture can have only a limited significance. Some support for this conclusion is derived from the finding that there is no stable isotope of mass 5. As the textbooks point out, the neutron capture process would come to a stop at this point. In the universe of motion, this argument is invalid. As we saw in chapter 24, the isotopic stability is determined by the level of magnetic ionization. The lack of a stable isotope of mass 5 is peculiar to the unit ionization level, the level that happens to exist at the surface of the Earth at the present time. In earlier eras, when the magnetic ionization level was lower, the obstacle at mass 5 was absent, or at least not fully effective, and in the future, when the ionization level has risen, this obstacle will again be minimized or removed. We must nevertheless concur that uh, concur with the prevailing opinion that the neutron capture that neutron capture is not the primary atom building process because even though the mass five obstacle can be circumvented, there are not anywhere near enough of the compound neutrons to take care of the atom building requirements. These particles are produced in limited quantities in reactions of a special nature. Atom building, on the other hand, is an activity of vast proportions that is going on continuously in all parts of the universe. The compound neutron is actually a very special kind of combination of motions. The reason for its existence is that there are some physical circumstances under which two-dimensional rotation is ejected from matter. In the material atoms, the two-dimensional rotation is associated with mass because of the way in which it is incorporated into the atomic structure. There is no way in which this mass can be given up because the process by which it originated, bringing a massless neutron to rest 
in the fixed spatial reference system is irreversible. The two-dimensional speed displacement is therefore forced into the only available alternative, the compound neutron structure, even though this structure is inherently one of low probability. Let us turn now to the process which, according to the findings reported in Volume 1, is, in fact, the primary means whereby atom building is actually accomplished. As brought out in that earlier discussion, the principal product of the decay of cosmic atoms, the original constituents of the cosmic rays, is the massless neutron, m one 12 0 This particle can combine with an electron, m 0 0 one or eject a positron, m 0 0 one to form a neutrino, m one half dash one half dash negative one. On the basis of the principles governing the combination of motions as defined in volume one, simple combinations of motions do not produce stable structures unless the added motion has some characteristic opposed to that of the original. However, this restriction does not apply to a combination with a neutrino as this particle has a net total speed displacement of zero, and the added motion is therefore the only active unit in the combination. Thus, a massless neutron can be added to a neutrino. Some significant consequences ensue. All massless particles are moving outward at the speed of light, or unit speed, relative to the conventional spatial reference system. But when the neutrino, m one half dash one half dash negative one, combines with the massless neutron, m one half dash one half dash zero, the displacements of the combination are m one dash one dash negative one, which means that the combination has an active inward two dimensional rotational displacement in a three dimensional type of structure. The addition of inward motions in the third scalar dimension brings the consolidation, consolidated particle to rest in the spatial reference system. The results of this sequence of events were described in Volume 1. As noted there, although the massless neutron and the neutrino have no effective mass, they do have the two-dimensional analog t squared over s squared of the three-dimensional property t to the third over s to the third that is known as mass. When one of these particles moving at the speed of light relative to the spatial reference system comes to rest in the gravitationally bound system represented by the reference coordinates, the unit translational speed thereby eliminated provides the necessary energy t over s to convert the two-dimensional quantity, the internal momentum, as we have called it, to the three-dimensional quantity, mass. The product of this process with rotational displacements 1, 1, negative 1, and um, a mass of one atomic weight unit is the proton. In conventional physics, the proton is regarded as a positively charged particle that constitutes the nucleus of the hydrogen atom. We find that it is, in fact, a particle which may or may not carry a positive electric charge. We also find that as a particular kind of motion, not as a particle, it is a constituent of the hydrogen atom. It is not, however, a nucleus. The mass one hydrogen isotope is a double rotating system in which the proton type of motion is combined with a motion of the neutrino type. The atom is formed by direct combination of the proton and the neutrino, but the existence of the particles as particles terminates when the combination takes place. At this point, the motions that previously constituted the particles become constituent motions of the combination structure, the atom. This is an appropriate point 
at which to make some general comments about the successive combinations of different types of motion that are the essence of the atom building process. The key to an understanding of this situation is a recognition of the fact that these are scalar motions. The only inherent property of a scalar motion is its positive or negative magnitude, and the representation of that magnitude in the spatial reference system is subject to change in accordance with the conditions prevailing in the environment. The same scalar motion can be either translational, rotational, vibrational, or rotational vibration, and it is free to switch from one of these to another to conform to changed conditions. Such a change is a zero energy process as previously defined, merely a rearrangement. This is the same kind of a situation that we encountered in chapter 17 in connection with ionization. As noted there, ionization of a particle can take place by means of any one of a number of different processes, absorption of radiant energy, capture of electrons, contact with fast-moving particles, etc. Since the motions that are involved are of, different type, are of different types, it might appear that we are confronted with a difficult problem when we attempt to explain these processes as interchange of motions. But the situation is simple when it is viewed in scalar terms. The only inherent property of these scalar motions, the vibratory photon motion, the rotational electron motion, and the translational motion of the atom or particle is the magnitude. It follows that the magnitude is the only property that is necessarily transmitted unchanged in an interaction. The coupling to the reference system that distinguishes the photon from the electron or from translational motion is free to conform to the new environment. In ionization, it takes the form of a rotational vibration, regardless of the type of antecedent motion. Production of the hydrogen atom in the manner described in the preceding pages terminates the role of the direct addition processes in atom building. The essential step in this process is to bring the massless neutrons from their normal motion at the speed of light stationary in the natural reference system to a condition of rest in the fixed spatial reference system. As pointed out in volume one, this requires the existence of rotational motion in all three scalar dimensions, since the particle is capable of moving at the speed of light relative to the spatial reference system in any vacant dimension. The massless neutron does not have the necessary three dimensions of motion, but combination with the neutrino provides the required addition to the neutron dimensions. This combination 1-1-negative 1 has a total three-dimensional rotational displacement or mass of one unit. The 1-1-negative 1 particle, the proton, thus produced cannot accept another massless neutron because of the two-dimensional nature of that particle. Nor can it accept a combination of the massless neutron with a neutrino, as that combination constitutes another proton, and consolidation of two protons is subject to the opposing factors previously considered in, co in connection with the direct combination of atoms. Beyond the mass 1 hydrogen stage, therefore, atom building takes place mainly by means of an ionization process that we will now consider. The neutrinos in the decay process, uh, products of the cosmic rays are subject to contacts with other particles, particularly photons of radiation. Some of these contacts result in magnetic ionization that is, a two-dimensional rotational vibration that is imparted to the neutrino. Since this is a one-unit displacement in opposition to the one unit of two-dimensional rotational displacement in the neutrino, 
the resultant net rotational displacement in these two dimensions is zero. As can readily be seen, such a charge could not be applied to a massless neutron. This particle already has zero displacement in the electric dimension, and if, one, if the one unit in the magnetic dimensions is neutralized, the particle would have no effective speed displacement and would be reduced to the status of the rotational base, the rotational equivalent of nothing at all. At the primitive level, magnetic ionization is therefore confined to the neutrino. The magnetic ionization process was discussed at length in chapters 24 and 25, and the steps through which the original ionization of the neutrinos is passed onto the atoms were described in considerable detail. At this time, we will take a look at the mass relations with the objective of demonstrating that the process by which mass is added during the events previously described is irreversible up to the destructive limits defined in chapter 25, and that magnetic ionization is therefore an atom building process of such broad scope that it is clearly the predominant means of accomplishing the formation of heavier elements. As explained previously, since the magnetically charged neutrino has no active speed displacement other than the one negative unit in the electric dimension, it is, in effect, a rotating unit of space, vibrating in the magnetic dimensions. A material atom, which is a time structure, net displacement in time, can exist in this space of the neutrino just as in any other space. Such an atom is continually moving from one space unit to another. If it enters the space of a neutrino, the rotational vibration of the space unit, the neutrino, is equivalent to and in equilibrium with a similar but oppositely directed rotational vibration of the atom. When the atom again passes into another space unit, it is a matter of chance whether the vibration goes with it or is left with the space unit, the neutrino. Thus, some of the magnetic charges originally imparted to the neutrinos in a material aggregate are transferred from the neutrinos to the atoms. Neutrinos, whether charged or uncharged, move at unit speed relative to the spatial reference system and their occasional periods of coincidence with atoms of matter are possible only because of the, fa uh, the finite magnitude of the units of space and time. If the magnetic charge stays with the atom when the atom and neutrino separate, the charge, which is moving at unit speed while it is associated with the neutrino, is brought to rest in the spatial reference system. Elimination of the unit of outward speed provides the unit of displacement required for the addition of rotation in the third scalar dimension and enables the unit of magnetic two-dimensional speed displacement to be absorbed into the atom, absorbed by the atom. Inasmuch as this unit that is absorbed has only half the mass of the full rotational unit, and has no rotation at all in the third dimension, it enters the atom as a unit of vibrational mass. If this puts the isotopic weight of the atom outside the zone of stability, some of the vibrational mass is converted to rotational mass in the manner previously described, moving the atom to a position higher in the atomic series. The transition from the massless state stationary in the natural reference system to the material status cannot be reversed in the material environment as there is no available process for going directly from rotation to translation. The subatomic particles are subject to neutralization reactions in which oppositely directed rotations cancel each other causing their speed displacements to revert to the translational status. 
but direct combination of two multi-unit atoms is difficult to accomplish. Because of the reversed direction of the forces in the time region, there is a strong force of repulsion between two such structures when they approach each other. Furthermore, each atom is a combination of motions in different scalar dimensions, even if two atoms acquire sufficient relative speed to overcome the resistance and make effective contact, they cannot join unless the displacements in the different dimensions reach proper, the proper conditions for combination simultaneously. With few, if any, exceptions, the additions to the masses of the atoms are therefore permanent up to the time that one of the destructive limits is reached. Here then, the first application of this atom building process is complete. By means of the successive steps that have been identified, the magnetic rotational speed displacement of the massless neutron produced by, the cosmic, by cosmic ray decay, the only active property of that particle, is converted into an addition of uh, to the mass of the atom. Successive additions of the same kind move the atom up the atomic series. Okay, we're going to stop right there for this, um, for this uh, episode, and uh, we will hopefully try to finish this chapter tomorrow. Now, my recommendation, if you want to learn this stuff, you're going to have to go real slow over uh, his discussion because he uh, makes a lot of, uh, you know, qualifications and a lot of adjectives that may be unfamiliar or, um, you know, just uh, his terminology. And um, I found, uh, since this is my second time through this today, uh, I got something completely different out of it both times. So um, it's a pretty hard read, as is all of Larson's stuff. But primarily, we're looking at this stuff in order to get the major points. You know, what, how does Larson form his particular uh, theory of everything, and what does he do with it, and how does he, how does he um, use it? Um, because this is a theory of everything, a generalized theory, and you can apply it to any subject. So, you know, if we can figure out how he does it with this chemistry, with this atom building in particular, then we might be able to apply it to whatever subject we want to apply it to. So, you know, we're not specifically learning, uh, you know, if we want to learn the chemistry, it's great, but we also are trying to just get the generalized picture. And that's why we're covering many of Larson's different books. Um, just today, we happen to be doing the basic properties of matter, as we've been doing for the last couple months. But we're getting to the end. So hang on tight, and thanks for tuning in today.